Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Today we're going to do something we've never done before, and that is to dedicate an entire program to one important shop tool, the lathe. We've built a lot of furniture projects over the years that involve the lathe. It takes practice to get good at, and over the years I've developed a few techniques and tips of my own. I'll share them with you today, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. Do you remember this project? It was one of the first New Yankee projects. A shaker candle stand. It has a nice turned column in the middle. Very simple, but elegant. Now the lathe that I used to turn this column isn't even in the shop anymore. Now this is a more recent project. This is one of the pedestals, the Queen Anne pedestal from our extension dining table. It has a nice heavy column in the middle with nice coves and beads. Right next to it is one of our upholstered pieces of furniture, which also has a turning. It has these legs, or they're sometimes called posts. Over here, a very recent project, our pier table, has a tapered turned leg. Starts out small at the bottom, comes up to a detail here, gets wider as it comes up to the top, has five nice beads right here. And this half circle piece, I actually turned on the lathe, split it in half, and made a corner for each end of the table. Now these are just a handful of the many projects we've done over the last 17 years that have turning. About 30% of our projects have turnings. So as you can see, it's an important part of woodworking. Now I'm a self-taught turner, and I wish I had a guide along the way to help me learn some of the procedures. So we are going to provide a home video version of this program with a printed guide that'll show the anatomy of a lathe, the tools that we use, and what they do. And you'll hear more about that before the program ends. We're lucky here in the workshop. Currently, we have three different sized lathes. Here's the smallest one. Now, the size of a lathe is determined by two things. One, the distance between the bed and the center of the drive, in this case, five inches, which means we could turn a 10-inch bowl. The second is the length of stock it'll handle, in this case, 16 inches. Now, a lathe this size is good for hobby projects, perhaps turning finials or small toys. And I know a lot of people who make wooden pens on a lathe like this. The next lathe we have is this one. This one's been in the shop for a long time, and it's done a lot of work for us. This one has a 12-inch swing, and it'll handle stock 36 inches long. Perfectly acceptable for a full range of woodworking projects. Now, here's our largest lathe. This one has a 16-inch swing, and it'll handle stock 40 inches long. Now, even though the size of the lathe is different, the basic elements are the same. It starts with a bed that must be perfectly flat. It can either be cast iron or steel. This is the working end of the lathe, the headstock. This one has an electric motor. Now, we've seen lathes driven by water power, a pole with a string on it, or even a treadle where you move it with your foot. Most, la most lathes today are electric, however. Inside this part of the headstock is a series of pulleys and a belt. By moving the belt onto the different size pulleys, I can vary the speed of the lathe. This one has an additional feature in that it has an electronic control to fine tune that speed. Here we have the drive center. It's just a spur that I embed in the stock that will turn the stock. Now it, it's a tapered fitting. So if the stock should catch, it'll slip, and it won't damage the headstock. Down at the other end of the lathe, we have the tail stock. And this has a couple adjustments. One, I want to be able to slide it along the bed for the length of stock I'm using and lock it in place. And secondly, I have this wheel, which will finally tighten the stock in place. This has a cup center. There's a cup with a centering point. This one happens to be a live center. It has a ball bearing so that it will spin freely. And lastly, we have the tool rest, which must slide along the bed freely and lock down. And secondly, it needs an adjustment feature to raise the tool rest up and down. These are the elements of the lathe. But before we work with any power tools, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. 
Now, the lathe is different than any other power tool. In the lathe, the workpiece is moving, so that requires some special precautions. Clothing. I don't want to have long sleeve shirts. Either roll the sleeves up or work with short sleeves. No jewelry of any kind. No watch, no rings, no chains, nothing like that. In addition to the safety glasses, I like to wear a full face mask because there's a lot of chips flying off the piece and should the piece come loose from the lathe, I want a little bit of protection. I also like to use a dust mask of some sort when I'm doing the sanding to avoid all the fine dust. Here's a piece that we built a couple years ago. It's called a butterfly table and it was inspired by an antique we found at Old Sturbridge Village. It has some nicely turned legs. While I was at Sturbridge, I took some photographs and measurements of all the transition points. And when I got back here to the shop, I took a piece of quarter inch plywood, transferred those measurements to the plywood, both the height of the transitions and the diameter. And then using a series of tools like this little drill index, I can draw a cove or perhaps a bead. Sometimes I use my compass or I break out the French curve to do some of the details. Now once I've got this all laid out I have a full-scale version of the piece which I use as a tool to do the layout on a blank which eventually ends up being a turning like this. Now this is a practice session, so I don't want to start with an expensive piece of mahogany. I'm going to start with a piece of firewood, and the greener it is, the better. The first thing I want to do is remove the drive center from the headstock. I don't want to drive the wood into that. And I want to get it approximately centered, this is an irregular shape, and drive it with a mallet so that it's embedded in the wood. Then I can slide it into the headstock, move the tailstock into position, Eyeball the center, lock it down, and now crank that cup into the wood and lock that down. Now I'm going to move the tool rest up to the work, and I'm going to spin it by hand to make sure it's as close as possible, but that the wood is not hitting the rest. Okay, that looks pretty good. Now the speed at which the piece turns. This lathe will go from 0 to 3200 RPMs. The recommendation for this size piece, the maximum speed would be 2700 RPMs. But because it's so irregular, I'm going to start at a very low speed, about 300 RPMs. Now to start truing it up, I'm going to use a gouge. This is a shallow gouge. And how I hold the tool is important. I want to bring the tool to the tool rest first. If I were to bring it to the wood, it would just slam down onto the tool rest. And I want to bring it to the wood, let the heel of it catch, and then bring it down so that the, the cutting edge starts to hit. Now to guide it, I'm going to use this overhand grip and slide it along this tool rest. My other hand is holding the tool further down on the handle. I don't want to move my elbow or my shoulder. I want to keep it tucked in, and that will give me much more control as I work on the piece. Now you'll note that there's quite a bit of vibration here, and that's not because I'm being aggressive, it's the irregularity of the piece of wood, a knot here or there, or the uneven shape. That means I have to have a really firm grip, and I'm going to take just a little bit at a time, I want to take my time, it's much safer, and I want to move my whole body as I run along the piece. One thing that I never do is start cutting from the end of the piece. It's very likely that I can catch the tool if I do that. I always start a couple inches back from the end, work towards the end. And once I get that cleaned up, I can step back a little bit further and continue. Well, we're getting there. Now I want to move the tool rest, and let me show you why. The larger the gap between the rest and the work, the more the end of the tool will hang over the tool rest, meaning that it's going to be harder to hold it down. The cutting action is going to want to lift the tool up. But the closer this is, 
the less likely that's going to happen and we're not going to catch the wood. Well now I can increase the speed to about 600. Now you might have noted that when I started the turning I was holding the chisel perpendicular to the wood and that's more of a scraping motion. I'm scraping across the fibers of the wood and that leaves a rough cut. However now you note that I've turned the chisel sideways and I'm sliding it along the tool rest like this. That creates a shear cut which gives me a smoother surface. Pretty good. Now you get the idea. Let's make something useful. It's out of here. How about a baseball bat? Baseball bat is nothing more than a nice straight grain piece of ash. The perfect combination of weight and strength. And the perfect project for us to practice our newly learned lathe skills. Let's make another bat. I've mounted a piece of ash in the lathe that I picked up at my woodworking supply store that's specifically made for baseball bats. It's a dried piece of very straight grain ash. Now for a template I'm using an actual bat and what I've done is I put layout lines starting from the bottom every five inches up the bat. I've transferred those lines to the blank. Now what I want to do is start getting down to the correct diameter. So first I can measure the actual bat with my caliper right there above this knob. And then I want to use this parting tool. It's a chisel that's ground to a point, And I want to cut a groove down to the diameter set on the calipers. Now with practice, I can use the caliper and the chisel at the same time. OK, that's perfect. Now I'll reset the caliper and move to the next line. Okay, that completes my reference cuts. Now I can start removing the bulk of the material, in other words, connect the dots. And for that, I'm going to turn to the gouge once again. I don't have to be too fussy at this stage. I just want to get close to those cuts. We'll fine tune it later. It's a good idea to have a grinding wheel not far from the lathe because you should be touching up the chisels throughout the process. Now I don't need a honed edge like a plane iron or a bench chisel. I just want to get a nice sharp edge where the cutting takes place. Do it freehand or up against the tool rest. I don't want to overheat the steel, so I keep a bucket of water around just to cool it down as I'm grinding. Now if I run my thumb over this edge, I can feel a little burr right at that leaning edge. If I were scraping with this chisel, I'd want to leave that there. But I like to remove it when I use a gouge, so I use a slip stone that's been soaking in water, and I just keep it tight to the tool and flat to the steel, removing that burr. Well, let's see how we did. Ah, that's better. Now I'll probably have to do that several times while I turn this back. Well, now you're beginning to see the taper on the bat, and we're able to follow the tool rest to get the correct shape. Well, we're getting there. We're close to those marks, and in order to get the final passes done, I'm going to turn to this tool. It's a skew chisel, sharpened at a slight angle. It has a bevel on both sides, and it takes a little bit of practice to use this tool. What I like to do is start it up against the heel, back here where there's no grind, and then rotate it up 
until that cutting edge just makes contact and I'll be cutting just a little bit below center. Keep it on the tool rest and guide it along. It's a nice sheer cut. It'll leave a smooth finish with very little sanding necessary. But one slip and I'll have a ding. Now the majority of the bat is the shape that I want and it's fairly smooth. I'm switching back to my spindle gouge and I want to flare up to where I'm going to meet that knob at the bottom of the bat. And now I want to set my caliper to the widest part of the knob and we'll use the parting tool to set a guide. Now I'm going to return to my skew chisel and start to cut the end of the bat. And what I want to do first is plunge in and come over, remove some material, plunge in again, and I'll keep doing that till I get about halfway through. Now I'll switch to a smaller spindle gouge, remove the excess, and then start rounding over that knob. You can see how both hands are involved in this move. One steadies the working end of the tool, and the other one turns it. Okay, that's good. At the head of the bat, I really just have to round it over. I'll use the same tools that I used to form the knob. Well, that's all we'll do with the cutting tools. Now we'll sand it, and that can be fun. I'll start out with 80 grit, go to 100, then to 150. I will wear a dust mask. All right, that does it. Now we'll take it out of the lathe and cut off the excess. All right. Here it is. A couple coats of varnish, burn a logo in it, and this bat will be ready for the big leagues. But hey, what happened to that table leg? Maybe we better get back to that. We've chosen this leg because it's typical of many forms that we see in furniture projects as well as home restoration projects. If I wanted to make more of these legs, I would start out with a piece of stock like this, in this case, poplar. Stock wants to be square, and the size has to match the square section of the finished piece. It would be very difficult to turn this first and then size the square portion. I also want to cut it to the correct length. With that done, I'm ready for the lathe. Now let's find the center point. I could draw a line from each corner, but I have this little tool, which is a centering tool. Put it on one side, then the other. That gives me my center mark. Now I want to take a scratch all and just go right in the center and get a point started. And next I'm going to take my drive center and drive that into the wood. And now we'll just chuck it up as we did before. Let's check it for balance. It should be perfect, but you never know. That's good. Now I'll take the template which you saw earlier and start to do some of the layout. And the first thing I want to do is mark the portions of the leg that remain square. And then I'll put a line all the way around the blank. I'm going to start right on this line. Here's the sample leg. Now over the years I've found that making this first initial cut at the corner, it can splinter away. So I like to use a skew chisel and just kiss it taking a little material at a time. 
Now, as I start this cut, there's a little bit of vibration, and that's because I'm hitting the corners. But if I control the depth of the cut and how fast I make it, the cut will be clean. Okay, that's what I want. No tear out. This centerpiece wants to be round. So I'm going to just knock off the corners with my gouge. I started my turning at about 600 RPMs. Once the corners are knocked off, I can speed it up to about 1,000. Now I take my layout tool and mark all the transition points. Now I just extend the line around the piece. Now I set the diameters just as I did with the bat. Although I have a reference point at the top and the bottom of the column, between, it's by eye. Here I've switched to my skew chisel which will provide a smooth finish on the taper. For this feature, I'm using a smaller diameter gouge. Here I've returned to my skew chisel to work on this little bead detail. For this cove, I'm switching back to an even smaller gouge. Now down here, we're simply repeating the techniques that we've shown earlier. And a little bit of sanding finishes it up. Congratulations, you just graduated from Lathe 101. Now I bet you're wondering what happened to that baseball bat. Take a look. Well, it was an overcast night at Fenway Park when we arrived, but the wind was blowing straight out. Great for home run hitters. And here's our hero, Kevin Millar. He's going to try my bat out in batting practice. Wish me luck. So this is the bat you normally use? Yeah. When I got a look at Kevin's bat, yeah, bigger I realized quickly that it was a little bit oh, yeah. heavier than mine. A lot of the weight was in the head longer. of the bat. It was about an inch and a half longer than mine, yeah. but he really liked the grip. He thought that that was yeah. just right. More up in the, in the head of the bat. Yeah. All right, here he goes. I sure hope he doesn't break it. Whoa, that one is off the wall. <laughs> Didn't break on that one. And that one is over the wall. Home run, all right. Another one. Hey, I think it's working. Oh, line drive. Yeah. Next time I'll turn you one that's better. Just a little more weight and we're there. <laughs> all right. Me. That was awesome though, man. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thanks. But the story doesn't end there. As the history books will tell, Kevin Millar and his teammates went on to win the World Series for the first time in 86 years. Maybe this bat had something to do with it. Go Sox! If you've enjoyed this new Yankee project, you may want to try some of the others. There are projects meant for the workshop, the garden, the kitchen, and many more. So whether you're a fan of Shaker style, or Colonial, Arts and Crafts, or Chippendale, there may be a norm project you'd like to build. Whether it's a clock or a gazebo, a picnic bench or a Windsor chair, a child's toy or a sailboat, visit the New Yankee website at www.newyankee.com for a complete listing.